And I'll first thank everyone for attending this special artist panel, uh, focusing on the use of XR technologies in art. Uh, we are joined today by three artists and uh, a digital art curator who will be leading the session. So I'd like to introduce them. First, our moderator today, uh, Esra Ozkan, is a digital art curator, and she'll be leading the discussion and uh, introducing the panelists in more detail in a moment. But our artists who are serving on the panel today uh, are Meltam Shahim, Tim Doyson, and John Gilberra. They're all working in uh, either augmented reality or virtual reality, a mix of the two, or in virtual exhibition. And then we're going to learn a little bit more about what really they're working with. It's a big field. A lot of different technologies kind of all merge together in different contexts and with different uh, exhibition partners, whether you're working at a museum or a gallery or you're doing things on your own. So uh, before we jump into that, before I turn things over to Esra, I would like to briefly introduce for those who are unfamiliar with Euro Immersive Turkey, who we are as an organization and what we are. We are the Turkish branch of Euro Immersive, which is a European Federation of XR professionals. Uh, we're all over the continent, not just EU nations, but continentally, uh, we are representing Europe. And we are trying to engender uh, more of a collaborative spirit among independent and uh, even institutional XR professionals around the continent. So the reason we do these events here in Turkey is to generate awareness and appreciation for the work that Turkish XR professionals and creatives are doing. Uh, to always invite those from other parts of Europe to share what they're doing, uh, to help, again, maybe spur and inspire some collaboration and some uh, of just more projects. So we have worked and done events in other sectors from medical to cultural heritage to entrepreneurship. Uh, and this, this event in particular is focusing on art. Um, and there's a, a lot to discuss. So without much further ado, I would like to introduce uh, Ethra again and turn the rest of the event over to her. But for those of us who are gonna be in attendance and listening, please feel free to write questions in the chat, uh, share some comments and inspiration that you have during the discussion. And if you uh, would like to ask your questions at the end, uh, we're planning to have some time for that, but uh, but there will be prepared questions as well that we'll get to. So we may not get to every question, but feel free, please, to write your questions in the chat, and we'll try to get to them one way or the other before the end of the event. Thank you very much again. Uh, we are recording the session, so for those who uh, have to leave early, you'll be able to see it later, uh, as well as you'll be able to, uh, to see this if you were not able to attend today. So thank you very much, and Esra, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for moderating today. Thank you, Michael. Hi, everyone. Again, my name is Esra, and uh, I'm a digital art creator. And see, uh, since 2011, I have taken an active role in different departments of galleries and the museums in the art industry and participated in many domestic and international um, exhibitions as a, as a creator and a director. And currently, my research on the concept of the post human uh, in the post digital era. And um, Meltem, <laughs> uh, the stage is yours. Uh, can you introduce uh, yourself and your works? And then, and the team, and the um, John um, show um, their works. Hello everyone, uh, this is Maltam and can you see? Yes. Okay. Hello, this is Maltam. I'm from Marmaris, small town in Turkey. And I study graphic design in my university. Then I went to MICA, like with a full ride scholarship to study illustration. And today I will talk about a little bit about kinetic sculpture. So I, I want to show how I started like this, like new media world. Like then I will like show some virtual exhibitions and a little bit AR and a little bit machine learning technologies. Uh, with the kinetic sculptures, actually, like when I went to MICA, my whole goal was to be like a really good children's book illustrator. And then I met with this guy, Paul, uh, he was working like in NASA and then he was a visiting engineer at our school. 
So actually he opened my mind and then thanks to him, I started doing like all the Arduino stuff and like 3D printing and laser cutting and stuff. So this, like you can see in this photo on the left, like this, this is like my first try of 3D print and it's like a really bad thing, but I wanna show the bad things as well. And on also, I really like also like how open source looks. So I wanna like commemorate, I wanna like conjugate, I don't know, I wanna like embrace this like open circuits and it's like almost like a party going on. So like these were the four, first thing that I was creating. These are like zoetrops or phenetoscopes. Like these are like optical illusion to, to, toys that I really enjoy. And because I was studying illustration also I'm really interested in animation. So combining animation with different kinetic toys was my passion at the beginning and I was also uh, including uh, aesthetics like philosophy of arts into it. And I was thinking that because philosophy of art is about like how we see things, how we uh, perceive things. So I was thinking that optical illusion toys can be a good uh, choice to depict those ideas about philosophy and stuff. And this was a kukla that I created. And it was like, the system was like that. And it was like one of my first project that I did in my master's year. So it was at the entrance of my thesis show and it was almost like saluting people when they, are en they were entering. And then it was like, almost like um, I preparing them for the exhibition. And this was my thesis show. We can see like different toys and animations and stuff like that. And then, so this is like how I like coming to today. And I wanna like talk a little bit about the virtual exhibitions. And then like, for instance, I did this GIF before, actually it was a sticker also, like for Instagram, then I created a GIF from that. Then there was a exhibition called Hypercortex. So like my 2D, 2D GIF was exhibited in a 3D virtual space like that. Then also this is my illustration. Uh, it's, uh, it's called Witches with Illuminating Hats because in Ottoman miniatures, like always like prophets uh, are depicted as wise men and they are always like depicted as their head is burning. So I wanted to like uh, combine this with the like burn the witch thing. And I, uh, I wanted to say with this illustration that actually like witches were the white ones and then they need to also have, have the uh, like fire on their head. And then for this like virtual exhibition, uh, the team was called FAM, the curators were, were called FAM. And then they transferred my 2D illustration to a 3D experience. They develop almost like a game. So each room was dedicated to a different illustrator's work. And there were hints in each room. So the people need to get, guess the hints, then it moves on and the game continues. Then I want to talk a little bit about my AR work also. This is what I mainly work about nowadays. So everything with the start with the PMS exhibition I did. Uh, PMS is an uh, augmented reality exhibition, which I did, I think, in 2017. And it was the first AR exhibition in Turkey. I was creating this and I was also like, I developed an app uh, with a team and that that time there wasn't like any like a ready apps that you can use like RTY or kind of like that to use for your AR, AR, AR work. So we have to develop our own uh, app for that. And PMS was about like premenstrual syn uh, syndrome of women. And then there were like 22 women artists in the exhibition. These are like some of the examples uh from the show i also i wanted to choose like different uh artists with different techniques and different backgrounds and from different cultures there were like 
six uh, artists from six different countries or something like that in the exhibition because I wanted to depict like each woman's experience is unique. So I wanted to combine both of them. And in the exhibition, it was like that, like with the app we developed, there were like posters on the wall and then you can see that posters are moving. Then the, I, I created this for the contemporary Istanbul for the mixer. And these were like the relief, relief like sculpture kind of illustrations. And then also there was an app that we developed again called Ohalde. That time there was like a curfew in Turkey. So I wanted to depict that, that everyone is like according to move, according to the box, no, like everyone is afraid to like move out of the box. And then we all like stuck in some places. So this was like this. And it is really funny because uh, at the end, there were like just three pieces and we have to develop an app for just three pieces. And it's like a really niche thing. And there will be only three customers that who's going to use it. And also like, uh, I always like to like combine illustration, animation. And I also, I make like, stickers from my work. So I iterate my works a lot from different like, platform to platform. I really enjoy that one as well. Like you can see my curfew work on the right below corner also. And then I created these also afterwards. I was thinking that also this idea suits the pandemic a lot. So I was thinking that these are almost like a choreography we do at our homes during the day, almost like a dance choreography. Then I started making IG filters. So this was like one of the first filters I created. So IG filters use the technology of AR. So like whenever like it started, like the Instagram enters the IG filters. I was like right into it because like it's a technology that I know and it was, and also it was like a, really fun to work with. So I did different filters. In here, I played with the idea of the filters also because in the IG filters and on Instagram, everyone is like enjoying, like seeing themselves, like selfies are the big thing. And in here it's the opposite one. In order to animate, the, in order to start the filter working, you have to close your eyes and like look inward. Then the filter starts. So I. I enjoy this eight idea. And then there were like lots of people commissioning me with the same kind of idea. And with IG filters, I also like to transform the whole environment and making almost like a collage kind of thing. And through my work, I always want to be like more like a healing and giving like positive feelings to the people. So this was more about like a Corona and like when you smile all the uh, like flowers on your lungs, like blossom and saturated. And then when you just stay still, they got desaturated. Or this is like an artist that like there's a singer and I, they, she commissioned me this work also for her new album release. So each song like this, there's a randomizer and there's like a quiz kind of thing. And then when it stops, there's like a random song that plays. So it's also like uh, people can hear different songs from her album. And I also, I think that IG filters are really important because they can get like viral so soon. And then they have a potential to use for good cause also. And I really appreciate that. And I think more artists should use like IG filters to spread their messages. And then this was about like ID, uh, Ida Mountain in Kazalar, like maybe you all like know, like Alamos company from Canada, like they were like digging everyone and cutting all the trees. So I wanna do, like it says like Ida Mountains are all of us, like you cannot touch it. So the tree is almost like a crown that we should like wear kind of thing. 
And then last year with the uh, Istanbul Lights Festival, they, they commissioned like a illustration from me. And then there was like a QR code you can see on the below. Uh, with the app they developed, you can see that uh, illustrations are moving. So it was like a mural illustration slash AR work that I created. And the last one is like, I started doing also like little bit, little bit like machine learning and like learning now, right now. And this is the first like, mm, like work that I created with ML technologies. And in here, I thought that like first I created the animation, then I start uh, in the second one, I tried to act like my animation. So I was mimicking my animation with the video. Then in the other ones, you can see that like, uh like i also like put the like which program i use and everything is so these are like my sketches and almost like i'm trying with the like ai i'm trying to create something so i'm trying new things in one i feed the like video animation and i uh, feed it with the one photo from the video or vice versa so there, they were like different versions i i was trying So that's it. Thank you. Thank you for your lovely presentation. And um, Tim, <laughs> can you introduce yourself and your works also? Yeah, I mean, thanks a lot. Um, first of all, for to Melton for showing your, her work. <laughs> it's quite nice what you're doing. It's fascinating to see how you're using these different technologies. And of course, also thank you to Ezra and to Michael for having me here. Thank you. Yeah, it's always good to be in touch. And um, I'm basically, you know, from Berlin. So I have a studio here and with my studio, we're doing a whole range of uh, XR projects going from like virtual realities um, towards kind of like web XR things into all the way to like augmented reality. And um, we have like a whole kind of like journey that we took originally coming like from a photography background and then, you know, doing 3D modeling and then with the new media coming around, getting into augmented reality and virtual reality. And first of all, I would like to show you a current project um, that I'm just, yeah, that I'm just working on or that's just being exhibited as part of the film festival in Munich. There's a Doko Film Festival running right now. And um, this is kind of like a AR exhibition um, that I did together with a friend of mine. So can you guys see the screen? So basically, yes. yeah, all right. So basically, uh, Loving Ones is, is like a story that was uh, originally conceived actually by, um, by Biljana and Manuel. And Biljana and Manuel are two filmmakers that are documentary filmmakers. And uh, it's a kind of a sad story, even so how they dealt with the whole situation was quite brave and amazing. But uh, Biljana was diagnosed cancer and um, she wanted to somehow deal with the situation and not just be kind of like taken down by it. So they decided to make a documentary about it. And um, they both approached me during this time and they asked me if I can make a series of portraits of them. Because when they first met, uh, when they were young, like 10 years before in Berlin, they made a whole series of portraits of both of them together. So they wanted to kind of like retake the same series of portraits. And um, that was kind of like the moment where we met each other. They came to my studio, so we took this portraits and that itself was quite an intense situation. And um, after we took those portraits, unfortunately, Miljana, Miljana passed away about like six months after this. And um, I talked to Manuel and uh, Manuel was telling me that they never finished the documentary because um, this illness was getting so heavy that they couldn't basically, they couldn't film enough material and they couldn't focus on it. So they only had these little snippets of video. And um, Biljana, it was really her wish to kind of like turn this into an art piece and, and finish it in some way or another. So I suggested to Manuel to make an augmented reality exhibition out of this by taking, you know, the portraits that we shot in the studio and then taking the materials that they have, the video materials and statements from um, 
from basically Biljana and put it together so we can still finish this and somehow tell the story that, that they both lived through. And uh, this is what we ended up doing. So to give you like a little bit overview, we went like from the documentary that originally was there but could never come into place. And then we made a AR exhibition out of it, which is kind of like creating a bridge between these two mediums, photography and film is, you know, not, it's kind of like very fascinating to do because a photo is like the art of a moment and the film is always like a stream of time. So by combining those two media, suddenly it gives you like, it gives you a different kind of, gives you kind of like a new kind of media because you can not only see the picture and what's happening in the frame, but you also start to see what is outside. You can almost, it's almost like having a look into the personal subjective story of, um, of Manuel and Piliana. But um, so we made this AR exhibition and we had a premiere doing another dog fest in Macedonia, basically. And we wanted to show it um, yet in, in another kind of like in Laval virtual, but then uh, COVID hit and that made it quite difficult to show augmented reality. Uh, as, as Melton probably knows, right? Because people need to come there actually and look at it and uh, kind of like um, be in the place itself. So we decided to take this exhibit and make a virtual reality version out of it. So we built, um, you know, like a tunnel and we placed the images in this tunnel and the video sequences and they would react to the viewer when they come in and look at them. So you can basically walk through it and like this in virtual reality you can also experience suddenly the story and that opened up yet another way of actually yeah kind of like artistically uh, working with this with the theme and working with with their work and uh, that whole virtual reality exhibit we then took it into a hubs room which was yet another step because it's like um it has both limits and possibilities hubs, let's say, you know, a big limit is that you can't program in, in it, but a huge possibility is that it's so easy to share and be there together. So suddenly you could be inside of this artwork together with other people and meet with them while you're looking, like while you're walking through the work and while you're inside of the work. And that I think is something that's really amazing that's happening because of, of XR technologies. So let me move to the next um, step that was kind of like during the actual process of creating the work where we kind of like arranged the images and we put together you know the video sequences or audio sequences so that we could tell a story even so it's not anymore kind of like a linear story like a film would be but since the audience like the whoever comes in can walk whatever way they want and uh, of course that, that brings something new into a story like this here i can give you like small impression how it ended up uh, looking actually, this was kind of like the actual AR part. And um, so when we had this opening uh, in Macedonia and Skopje, of course, on one side, you have the actual posters of the exhibit and now you can use augmented reality and already start to play the story. And in this picture, you can see it's, it's actually a video from the photo shoot. So suddenly we have a frozen moment and a living moment and they both connect, you know, like in the eyes of the viewer when they when they go into the piece. So that there I think uh, are some really kind of like intense moments that can happen when you start to work like this. And it also shows you the possibilities that come up in the moment where you use new media actually and you can start to kind of like tell tell new stories. And this was kind of like the entire exhibit then where people could just kind of like, we had some tablets there and they could take their tablets and then just walk through the exhibit and, and um, get to know their story this way. And um, like I said before, when this was over, we took it into kind of like a virtual reality version because of, of COVID. And um, that ended up then being like this. So it's kind of like a, in a way, it's a it's a very different experience because suddenly you're immersed in the in the space and it makes it, it makes it very personal. So um, it was quite interesting to see what happens. And what was also fascinating in that work was that 
suddenly because there's a tunnel and you walk through the tunnel, it still somehow gives you a direction for the story. I mean, you can, of course, walk back if you like, but nevertheless, there's this way or this way. So it kind of gives you a certain degree of freedom, but nevertheless, there's some storytelling going on and, and following that. So that was quite fascinating to do actually in this work. And you can see these little images. This is basically the story of the entire life, you know, like with the kids that have been born and the things they lived through together all the way until this uh, moment where they had to pass away. So, oops, let me move on to the next. So for me in my work, in a way, it's, it's all about kind of like storytelling or rather working, working with XR technology, I would say it's even like it's story living, you know, because suddenly you are in a 3D space and you can interact with the pieces and works. So it's actually more like living inside of the story and experiencing it like that. And I think it's quite fascinating to see the spectrum, like from the actual storytelling to the story living and what happens in between. It's like, it's a long story, this, <laughs> the story of storytelling and story living. And um, these are kind of like what we are doing right now, I want to just give you a small impression, like we're working on, on, a, on an app right now that is not directly an art piece, it's more like for, for like a tourist one, but it's really nice because it involves both like storytelling and the kid's story and an adult story. And we're using different techniques here. And one of them is, is like Volo cap recording, which is um, this one here where we just shot kind of like uh, three, 3D footage of an actor, um, 3D footage of an actor, and he just introduces a landscape to you and then you jump into basically like an interactive landscape where you can find different information. And um, with a kid's story, we have a lot of fun right now because um, what we are doing here is um, we just set up our studio and now we're doing motion capture So as you can see right now, we're just having fun uh, actually exploring technology and seeing <laughs> what you can do with it. And um, I think it's, it's really exciting because, you know, it's not only uh, VR and AR, but uh, as Melton already mentioned, it's also machine learning that you can use. It's interaction, it's real time. You can use sensors, you know, so there's 3D printing. So there's so many different possibilities that are open right now for artists. And that I think is just fantastic. You know, it's kind of like a creative playground out there. So <laughs> it's fun to be out there and play. Uh, oops. Yeah, this is just a little kind of sketch of how we approach projects uh, actually at, at this point, you know, in my studio, it's always like having, uh, wait, sorry. It's always having like the topic at the, at the core and then just deciding like creating a story universe and then branching out into the different medias that are there into VR or AR or XR rooms or just rendering a traditional movie. And that's another thing that I think is, is really exciting and that we are doing a lot in the studio, kind of like really using these game engines and XR platforms as a kind of like jumping board into, into different medias and seeing what happens when you take a story actually into a different kind of like technology and how it changes the whole thing that you are talking about. And um, yeah, at the end, I just come back to, to the beginning, let's say, because um, what we did now during the Dog Fest in Munich, when we showed Loving Ones, since there's still COVID here in Berlin uh, and in Munich, unfortunately, and everything is locked down, we, we just had a, um, you know, this, this work in a gallery in Munich, and we ended up just hanging the pictures of Biljana and Manuel into the window of the gallery and um, people can walk by, they can download the app in the iOS store and, and to, in the Apple store, and then they just can look at it uh, from the outside. 
So that's kind of like a small impression of that. And I think that is another possibility that opens up for artists in, in this moment, you know, that you can actually produce an app, push it into an app store, and it's a whole other way of, of distrib distributing and, and creating creating works of art and getting in touch with the audience and sharing sharing the content. Yeah. So this is this one. And I would say with that, I come to an end to my presentation. And um, yeah, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you for your impressive presentation and also um, a storytelling and a story living. It is important point, I think. And thank you for your sharing ideas. And uh, John, um, also, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, hello, everyone. Um, hi. Thank you, Estra, for your invitation and Michael. And uh, it's very cool to see your work, Tim and Maltem. And it's it's really also uh, cool to get in touch with our colleagues. Um, John, John, so, sorry, uh, sure. Tim, um, could you please um, close your sh um, share screen? The thing is, uh, I don't have the. Uh, you know, like the controls to close it right now. I don't know where they went in my Zoom, but can you do that from your side? Just kick no, me out I, of No, I couldn't. Uh, Michael? So I would just jump out of the meeting then and come back in. And then come back. Okay, yes. okay. All right. Okay, so. It's, uh, uh, I, um, hmm? no, okay. Just one second. I don't know what happened here with Zoom, but um, so I will be back soon. Okay. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> yes, okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, John, you, you, you can come. Sure. So uh, I, I'll try to share my screen as well. I have an unstable connection, but hope it works and I don't drop out. Let's see. So can, can you see my screen? Yes, yes, Okay, yes. okay, all right, cool, all right. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's great to be here, guys, with our colleagues, and uh, it, it's been also really cool to see all the overlaps with Maltem's and Tim's work. Uh, we, we obviously share a lot of similar interests and approaches uh, to immersive media, and I, I wasn't able to uh, play my full presentation here, but um, you can see the videos of all the works that I'm going to show here on my website and on my social accounts. Um, for the last 10 years, almost now, uh, I've been working with immersive media. My first steps into this form of creating art was uh, starting using projection mapping in my undergrad years. Uh, I was in Istanbul and I studied uh, visual communication design in Bilgi University. Uh, we, we had a great program over there and um, it, it, it was a great time to just learn a lot of different techniques in terms of like digital technologies. And this, this museum over there we had, we, we uh, held so many great uh, media art exhibitions here. And I was as a student with scholarship in the design program we were also supposed to work at school. So I've been involved in many of those cool uh, media art exhibitions in this museum. So it's, it's been super educational to see uh, all these great works of art in, in new media. So I learned a lot there. Um, I also have a background in physics and I was also always interested in like illustrations and physical work as well. And um, during those years, after I learned more about like 3D techniques and modeling and all those things, and especially after starting uh, working with projection mapping and to see my work outside of screen and let the work come into the real space. And as someone who is also uh, had interest in uh, uh, cinematic arts, uh, I started to develop my own, you know, aesthetics using space and architecture and, you know, 3D renderings and uh, shadow and light illusions and such. And also the scene in Europe with this light festivals and projection mapping festivals was uh, really cool at the time. Uh, it, it, we weren't able to do these kind of shows in the last one or two years now, but 
hopefully we're going to be back there again. So I, I, I was involved in these type of large scale architectural audiovisual shows for several years and I developed these uh, abstract audiovisual aesthetics and in uh, 2015, uh, like Maltem, I also had a Fulbright scholarship and I moved to San Francisco. I, I did my uh, master's over there in arts and technology. And during these, uh, during the master year years, uh, I also had a studio environment and we also had like physical workshops, wood workshop, metal workshop, all these uh, more traditional studio art environment. So um, after doing all these architectural projection mapping projects, it was a good time for me to uh, focus more on uh, gallery scale. So I, with the techniques that I learned, you know, in the design studies, I tried to create more like sculptural forms and merge the digital and the physical through creating such forms. And, and, and then that interplay between the physical and the digital became a, 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 a exploration in itself because it's a very fruitful time and being also in San Francisco helped a lot in terms of um, having access to some of these new VR technologies or AR technologies because before it was released. So focusing on those gallery scale sculptural um, pieces and experiences became an interest. And then after doing so many projection mapping projects in using architecture, I became more and more interested in how can I create a more, more immersive experience? How can it uh, can use a space better? How can it be more, more immersive, more 3D, more, more uh, surrounding? So domes became an interest. Uh, during that master years. And in, in 2015, just before I moved to San Francisco, I visited uh, Montreal uh, during the Immersion Experience Symposium. And I was super inspired by this biosphere structure uh, built by Buckminster Fuller. And, and, and he's a very uh, visionary, amazing architect and systems engineer and philosopher. and. I was already super inspired by his philosophy and, and uh, during this immersion experience symposium, we also had over there Allegra Fuller, uh, back Mr. Fuller's daughter. And, and she, she's another scholar and she gave a really cool speech about her uh, father. Uh, and when I started doing my masters, I was super inspired by this and I focused on his work and I wanted to create a cool dome experience and 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 then i started to explore more about his work and also how how could i transfer the aesthetics i have developed for the space and architecture with projection mapping techniques into this dome environment and then playing with uh, equi rectangular 360 imagery became another cool uh, technical exploration. And while I was developing content for uh, spherical content for the dome environments, I also realized, wow, this is the same technique that uh, I can create also VR experiences with. And first I started to create a 360 version of this piece I was uh, building for the dome environment and then uh, discovering how um, flexible a content uh, is when you create this 360 equi rectangular imagery because you can use that in domes, uh, you can project it in, uh, it in VR. And also I was able to create these kind of uh, panoramic installations as well because it, it's a seamless, uh, uh, with the QI rectangular imagery, we can create seamless uh, panoramic images too. Uh, and at that moment, uh, being able to exhibit this audiovisual piece in so many different formats and in, in so many different places, uh, I, I entertained myself with the idea of how can I uh, do more um, location-free projects 
So I was exploring this remote working idea in 2015 before COVID. Um, it really helps because while I was creating physical pieces as well, for instance, here is a, a 3D uh, printed sculpture. I'm, I'm gonna talk about this later more and there are more uh, dome projects here, yeah. I, I had the opportunity to do an artist residency at Autodesk's Pier 9 residency in San Francisco. And in this facility, they have great 3D printers, laser cutters, CNC machines, and all that kind of stuff. So after creating so many uh, digital experiences, it was a cool time to bring those experiences into physical form using these. And I was also doing my uh, master thesis. Uh, meanwhile, I was doing this uh, residency at Autodesk. So I tried to merge everything, all these different experiences with different media in one installation. And um, one of the things that I realized with the VR exhibitions, uh, when the VR works are exhibited in this gallery uh, setting, uh, there was long lines, people were waiting and and most of the time, the headset was the attention of focus and you don't see anything about the work. So the tech was really highlighted, but we, we didn't have any idea how the experience worked. So I, I tried to bring more elements from that VR experience into the physical space using 3D printing and projection mapping and all those things. These are some of the uh, sculptural explorations from that period. These are more space explorations using uh, particle uh, simulations. So I came up with this uh, concept called mediated virtuality and I was basically trying to visualize how a four dimensional object would look like in three dimensions. So I was creating these three dimensional projects, projections of higher dimensional geometries. And then I uh, attached uh, Vive sensors on these objects. And so that you were able to hold these sculptures both in the physical space and also you have an augmented version of that in the virtual space. So uh, the whole room that I, um, you know, used to exhibit this piece was mapped with all these objects and prints and uh, and also one of the cool thing was also people were able to experience the piece before they were in VR and then when they have the headset they have an expanded version of that uh, installation. Uh, so this was a this was a good um exploration for me in terms of playing with this sense of scale and presence in both physical and digital space because uh, the experience was starting with interaction with these forms and then these forms are becoming a space around you so you feel tiny in that room and then you become a giant and just it it, it was just a uh, exploration of presence in both spaces. And then I explored more of these uh, sculptures in, in motion. So I created these speculative digital installations with, with the idea of later these can become a physical installation uh, using large scale screens or uh, they can be kinetic sculptures or they can be just virtual exhibitions. So. For me, the distinction between these different spaces wasn't really the case, but uh, using these 3D environments, I was exploring without any limitations of uh, physical constraints and material costs and all those uh, architectural problems of people have, you know, in the physical world. So I just freed my imagination and did a lot of these explorations and they became a part of you know, different installations and commission projects. Uh, later, I had the chance to work at Adobe in, uh, and I was the, one of the first artists with Zach Lieberman in their uh, augmented reality uh, artist residency program. Um, the highlight of this experience for me was um, how much an artist can have a 
vital role in a software team, for instance, because software teams are developing all these tools, but at the end, the artists or designers are going to use it. So they were uh, re receiving weekly feedback from us. You know, how can we make this more uh, user friendly or like what are what are what are the tools that you will need when we create this drag and drop uh, simple softwares that you don't need to code your own uh, you know experience so uh, and I came up with these with this face tracking uh, projection installation later I I went back to domes and uh, I started to work more on uh, meditation experiences using these uh, immersive environments with by you know collaborating with wellness teachers and lately this became more of a focus for me to use immersive experiences for more wellness purposes you know how, how can we regulate our mood through vr or dome experiences or you know audiovisual experiences so it's not just about exploration of media or technology or you know creating cool shows using all this imagery but like like really benefiting from uh, the good parts of this technology and this is more of my focus right now so that's that's my work in a nutshell thank you thank you um for your sharing creative ideas actually thank you Asa. and okay um and let's jump in panel and uh, i would like to ask um questions and all of you and um actually um, we all do storytelling in our works, including me. And I want to ask you um, all how you integrate technology into storytelling and how, uh, how do you uh, think storytelling be if we think about it uh, specifically to um, XR, VR and AR and uh, immersive space special. And um, Meltem, maybe <laughs> um, you want to yeah, uh, sure. start or, yeah, okay. Yeah, 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 I, I can start. Like, uh, actually, uh, also, I want, I want to thank all of you <laughs> and also all the artists for the, like, like mind opening, like, all the ideas and everything. And, and also, I took a screenshot of Tim's also story living thing <laughs> as well. And... And in, uh, for instance, like for AR, for like when I think about my experiences, for instance, in the PMS, like there were like posters on the wall. Like when you enter the exhibition, you can see each woman's unique experience via illustrations on the wall. However, when you look at it through the app that we developed and other layers added, and it's all like, almost like a secret is revealed thanks to the AR. And also like this technology pushes people to like explore more, maybe like spend more time because there's like another layer, so they became more curious. So I think it's a lot like to the storytelling, especially like, because like a PMS is like a more like a intricate, like sensitive concept, like it's like more unique thing. So it's like opening something. And I think it's different. Like for instance, with the AR filters, like it's like different because in AR filters, you need to be fast. And like, yeah. there's like stories are like 15 seconds or something like that. There are room for like long storytelling and lots of ideas. It, it needs to be clear and understand in an instant. And so it's like a different versions, like with, even in AR, it's like, I think it changes from like platform to platform. Thank you. And, and John or Tim, what do you think? Well, then I just pick up the ball there and um, I think uh, what, what Melton just said in terms of surprise, that, that's a really nice uh, idea and concept because you find it both in kind of like traditional ways of storytelling. Mm -hmm. Like let's say film is very linear, right? It really goes from A to Z. And all the kind of like dramaturgical rules of film are based on that. You know, when you take away the linear progression, it doesn't work anymore. But yet you have surprise. There's a moment where there's a turning point and you're like, oh, what's happening now to the character? And kind of like AR technologies or XR technologies in general can really give you the possibility to, to include surprises because it's real time. 
you know, so things can happen and can change around kind of like uh, in the spare of the moment. And uh, maybe that's also something that makes games so exciting because you're really actually kind of like there in the moment where it happens. Mm -hmm. But that being said, that I think is also quite kind of like the challenge in it because you still need to find out what are kind of the dramaturgical rules. How can you make a story really like exciting? How can you get an audience to follow the story? How can you kind of like maybe like in film you have a frame so you always know where you're looking at. In 360, as, as Cam probably knows quite well, you don't know what they're looking at. So you have to somehow include those, those kind of things in a different way. And uh, I would say in a way, it's all about exploring that right now. Mm. Uh, I'm gonna continue then. Yep. Cool. Uh, yeah, I agree with Tim and Maltem. Like they, they, they described really cool parts of how we can approach to storytelling in immersive media. For me, it, what comes to my mind is uh, I, I always had an interest in um, film and cinema and I was writing stories before I was interested in digital arts and I, I was actually an aspiring director uh, before diving into the digital technologies and everything. But um, um, like during my studies, one of the books uh, from 70s, uh, Expanded Cinema by Jean Youngblood, media theorist, uh, it, it became a really uh, important source material for me. And in that book, Expanded Cinema, he in, in, in 70s, he was exploring how the future of cinema is going to take shape. And we're gonna move from uh, the drama, dr dr drama structure, drama-based structure to toward a more technological uh, sensory experience kind of uh, pieces. And he was really foreseeing like 50 years ago, he understood where this was heading. And he was talking about holographic displays. He was talking about uh, fully computer generated experiences. So he, uh, he, he was describing something more of a, a combination of uh, musical experiences and cinematic experiences. And, and I don't know, like holography or something like that. So I, I, I and he, he was also saying that this hero's journey myths exploring story structure is going to come to an end. So um, in my work, uh, like Tim said, in VR, for instance, we don't have director, we don't have framing. So, uh, you know, close ups uh, and establishing shots, all those kind of language doesn't work anymore in that new space. Um, I, I, and also, I always liked the idea of nonlinear storytelling as well. I guess for me personally, I'm more interested in um, a pro, even if it's a physical installation or a, a virtual installation, I like creating spaces. So in, instead of uh, pointing people what to look at, I like uh, placing audiences in, into the middle of the experience. So they, they, they can have their own sensory experience and come up with their own interpretation of what that was about, you know? So uh, I, I like creating that setting set and, and feeding their sense, senses, and then they can come up with their own interpretation. And actually how do you create the, uh, how do you create a, a perception of the time? and space in specifically AR, XR and VR technologies. I want to ask you this because uh, the main factors uh, creating our experiences are time and space. So uh, a work also takes form within time and space and moreover leaves a mark uh, in the user's memory actually. How do you create it all the perception? And John, can, can, can we continue? Yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I can, I have a background in physics too, so I can talk about time indefinitely, you know, but uh, <laughs> let's, let's leave the philosophical aspect of time mm -hmm. and, you know, let's, let's talk more, more practically, you know, so each, each, each uh, different project comes with its own time constraints. Mm -hmm. So for instance, if we are talking about a light festival, Usually those pieces are around 10 minutes or 15 minutes because we're, those 
installations are based on the attention span of people mm -hmm. because you're you're not watching a movie uh, you're not following a character so it's not it may not be that compelling in terms of like what you're looking at like some people can look at abstract moving shapes and images for hours and some maybe can just for a minute or so so that that's an aspect another mm -hmm. aspect also um is immersive experiences can be really overwhelming you know uh and and you you, you can really feel a lot or uh you can have motion sickness in vr experience or or you you can just feel overwhelmed by the sounds and moving images and everything is so fast so uh that also comes with its own um time constraint mm -hmm. uh for but for me like lately when i'm creating an installation uh especially if you're creating a permanent installation i'm trying to create something that you can look at indefinitely like a scenery or 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 like a dynamic environment you know like how like how the nature works so uh, i i'm trying to not to overwhelm people and keep it smooth and it and i'm trying to approach it more like a living livable environment you know so mm -hmm. So that there is no really like you can feel the time progression, but it's not really timed that you can feel where the loop is, you know. Yeah. So it's focusing more on indefinite loops, maybe. It's where I'm at with time. <laughs> yes, actually, I agree with Jen. That's why I was like really interested in GIFs, also like the seamless loop, also like. I don't know, like enjoys me a lot. For instance, like in my master thesis, I was like uh, making those zoetrops I was showing. It was actually like to depict the idea of like Nietzsche's time. And like, according to him is also like time is like more like a circular and like past, future and the, uh, uh, now like happening at the same time. So everything is like happening again and again and again. So I thought that the, like the nature of the gifts are like loops and also like the a zoetrope itself like also like a circular motion that enhanced the like also this kind of circular like seamless loop so also i really enjoy that's why I like gifts like for instance at the beginning like because i was like like shifting from illustration to animation mm -hmm. like it's the difference is the time like between illustration and animation and i was feeling so powerful when i was like first doing the animations because you lock people like beginning illustration you cannot like control like they can just look for five seconds but at the animation you lock people in this uh, room and then they have to watch it in that certain time but like john said afterwards i was like more interested in gifs okay and tim <laughs> what do you think how do you create the perception of time and space I think that's a real challenge. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe the space one is easier to answer, you know, because that has a, a lot to do with uh, 3D modeling and kind of visual effects. Even so maybe understanding space in a wider sense is, is yet another question, because obviously once you work, uh, move into VR and you don't have any more the law of physics or mm -hmm. anything like this that limits you, you can create really imaginative spaces. And with the perception of time, I mean, first of all, I would really, really agree with Meltem and, and Cam, because in uh, most of the things we're doing, we're also st starting to get more to kind of like creating atmospheres or loops that can go on for, for a longer time that has simply to do with the fact that when you move around and it's really based on where our audience goes, you don't know how long they spend time in a certain moment. But um, that doesn't mean that you cannot also include time. I mean, we are right now conceptualizing one work that we might make uh, for for the next summer, and uh, it's about talking about the sunset. You know, so we want to make an AR piece that reacts to the kind of intensity of the sun going down. That is only going to work at that certain time of the day, right? And it's only going to last for the time where the sun goes down. So that is kind of like trying to introduce time again, and. Um, when you're talking about music, it gets also, again, you are in that kind of like between linear and non-linear, but we made a, a piece last year, year with a comp composer um, from Berlin and um, 
it was an XR space and he took one of his songs and he took it apart into, into the different instruments and replaced it in an in a XR room. And when you're in the XR room, you can float in between those points and the composition changes the whole time depending on, on where you are. So that can be endless. You can always just float around and, and just like be in one spot or another and you have your own kind of like individual version of that composition. And that one had both like an element of time in the sense of it was a definite composition and it went through like a three minute and then it would start over again. But mm -hmm. at the same time, if you would move to another spot, it would sound totally different, you know? So it's kind of like, I think you have to weigh the balance between, in a way between these linear techniques and, and maybe the, the complete like uh, more dynamic real time looping approaches that are there. And another question that comes up of course is what is the time of the story you're telling? I mean, yeah, yeah if you're looking at this piece of like um, Manuel and Piana, basically the portraits, we took them, it took us two hours. You know, it's mm -hmm. like an, in the studio a photo shoot that that was going on for two hours. And when you're photographing, you kind of try to capture the essence of a situation in, in a split second, just kind of like taking that little abstract moment. But then mm -hmm. the actual story we are telling with the videos together in the augmented reality, it's it spans over 10 years, you know. So suddenly there's two levels of time that are coming together. And then there's a third level, which is the time the audience actually spends inside of it piece and mm -hmm. what happens when they walk through it so there's definitely all these different aspects that go into it yeah. <laughs> and um uh, with the pandemic and um, uh, you had to be much more interested in technology than before and does this process tire out you are tire out to you and or you say uh, this is how we were already working and nothing has changed for us <laughs> Um, so I, I can start, I guess. Oh, um, okay. So for me, at first it felt like, yeah, like I was already living like this. Nothing is going to really change for me. I was mm -hmm. already, uh, you know, forming my lifestyle around working remotely and being able to showcase my work at distance. So I don't need to actually go there and put nails on the wall and install the work, but I figured out a way to do it remotely, but mm -hmm. after a while, so for a while it went smoothly and I felt like it's even a better time now for me because now everybody works this way. So I'm not going to be this, you know, uh, uh, rare person trying to push this idea to the curators or people I'm working with. Oh, we can do this remotely. Why should we meet? But after a while, after a year, after a year or two, <laughs> it began to feel so anti anticlimactic. You know, you complete a project, you send the yeah. file, you have a drink, and but, then drop. You know, yeah, it just that you don't feel anything. You know, yeah, like yeah. some people are seeing over there, but you don't really interact with people or enjoy it as from their eyes. You know, so it just began to feel very anticlimactic and not really rewarding, you know, uh, uh, at the end, mm -hmm. like when a work is complete. So that's, that's what I feel at the moment. <laughs> I satisfying. agree with you. I totally, yeah. totally agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> and Matt, have... uh, what actually did for, you... <laughs> yeah, for me, it was like the opposite, like at the beginning of like, when I realized that pandemic will come to Turkey also, I got like immediately get anxieties and everything. And normally I'm like a really calm person, but I was thinking that the world will end. Then I started like, I quit everything like for a month. Uh, and I started like beading uh, a sculpture, like a soft sculpture. So I was just like beading and beading. And it was like, I was making a human sized friend to myself. And I called it like my quarantine friend. And I was just like working <laughs> with, with it. And I was like super happy. And after a month, I was just listening to podcasts and doing this thing. And after a month, I was like, okay, I'm ready. Then now I like, I feel good. And also like for me, because like there are so many digital artists in Turkey, I got like lots of more commissions. So it was like crazy. I had to attend like five exhibitions, mixed exhibitions, like virtual exhibitions in one month or something like that. 
So I had to actually work more than before. Like it was like a plus for me because I was like also making money. And also for the first time, like people were asking for like process videos and then they were actually paying for like process videos and kind of things they did because they want to see like inside of like people's studios and stuff like that. So actually like money wise, it was a good for me, but still like Jan said, uh, actually like feeling detached and because like for instance the Istanbul Light Festivals I couldn't even see it like I want to go but like I couldn't go ahead and you know, like he said also I couldn't talk with people interact with people and I, I couldn't see how they were like reacting it but thanks to IG filters actually like my with the filters like lots of can people can try it and then I can like see like how they use it differently and stuff. So I can actually like connect with IG filters with lots of people. So it's like a really good thing for me because also I think that filters are almost like, I don't know, performances. And normally I'm thinking that while I'm creating a work, like, like Marla Ponti says that like artist becomes the art when he's like, when he or she is producing the work. But with the filters, actually the users can become the art. So it's like a really interesting thing for me. And it's like, without them, like filters are nothing. So like the interaction part with the filters like satisfies me from this sense. Thank you. And Tim, you're in Berlin. <laughs> and yes. how do you feel? <laughs> Isolated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of like crazy being in the middle of Berlin. And if I go out to the shop, sometimes I'm like, oh my God, I'm in Berlin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously it has been a really, a really hard time um, for for all of us in a way. Even so, um, as, as I mean, I think we, we are partly lucky ones because we can actually work and and this gave a whole kind of like uh, push to, to XR and reality. But if you look uh, around what's going on in the world, of course, it's not the most fun thing that's going on with this pandemic. But um, yeah, for me, it was quite like when it first started, it was actually kind of like with what Kim just said. I was already doing VR and XR. And so it was like, OK, I'm, I'm just doing the same as before. And suddenly it, there was, of course, much more interest around because uh, people were searching for new ways of meeting and kind of communicating. So. We have been really, really busy, let's say, the, the last two years putting up all these XR things. And um, that was quite exciting. And um, I think, uh, of course, you can never really kind of like replace the real meeting and, and kind of like the physical being there. But um, I think in all of that, for me, kind of like XR opened up a whole nother way, especially social XR, you know, like being on the web and being able to go into into an XR room and meet with others as avatars and explore. I mean, Michael is actually a big part of that, right? Because he organizes all these zero events, which was a fantastic time of going through different VR platforms together and actually making new friends that I would have never made uh, without, without all of this happening. And um, this social, yeah, do you want to say something? <laughs> um will xr technologies be a good solution for online exhibitions after the pandemic and what do you think is possible a good it, solution i mean i think it's definitely part of the solution you know mm -hmm. it's going to be hybrid um, exhibits right so yeah. it's really like um, kind of the interaction between the physical space and the virtual space that cam was actually already exploring before and I think that's going to get even more important and it's going to open so much possibilities for museums, for galleries, also for curators and artists, because suddenly you can have shows that are happening in more than one space, or mm -hmm. you can have a real audience and you can have a virtual audience, you can have interactions between the virtual space and the real space. So there's so many possibilities of making those things work with each other. It takes down the boundaries, it takes down yeah. the, the physical distance, and it's great to retain that and push it further. Yeah. And John, thank you, thank you, Tim. And John, how do you design your physical experiences and on online experiences? In other words, when you are designing your work with an XR te technologies, AR and or VR, and uh, you determine the uh, audiences actually experience according to what and uh, what should the um, audience experience in your work you you mean like 
different approaches between yeah vir virtual, virtual exhibitions, exhibitions and yeah yeah, yeah. Phys yeah physical and physical exhibitions. yeah and also yeah. immersive spaces your yeah areas. I mean my you know esp especially in this last year or so with this solutions for continuing the you know exhibitions and festivals and we did one in plug in two last uh, December so uh, uh, like I said I, I was already entertaining myself with exploring uh, speculative installation projects in the virtual space so there wasn't much difference for me because I was already in that space and I was already um, my my exploration process is already takes place in the virtual space so it it, it, it was a just transferring those ideas into different platforms and most of the virtual works uh, took place i mean virtual exhibitions took place as a web web based you know web 3d web gl whatever that you know browser based format so uh you need to have less detail with the 3d models when you were exporting them or you have certain constraints in terms of like compression with the videos and so, but I guess um, there wasn't much difference, but uh, we were mimicking more of how a physical gallery setting works mm -hmm. in the digital space. So for instance, although I could have sent like a totally 3D environment, like a VR experience of that same experience in one of these virtual exhibitions, curator, um, you know, they, they wanted to have more like a actual physical projection installation. So mm -hmm. we, we made it like a tunnel, for instance, uh, um, because it just fits better in their, you know, platform they're building. Mm -hmm. So so I guess from, from my process point of view, there wasn't much change. It doesn't make much difference for me if it's a physical or digital space, but uh, more of the production side, uh deals with that you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. thank you and Malta. Yeah, in there like also like i agree with john like in the sense that because i think that like virtual exhibition most of i mean like most of the ones that i attended are just mimicking the gallery space and the galleries were just like making their like 3d scan their spaces and then making the experience there but then maybe you don't add anything to the experience and it's actually less of an experience if it is just like, I don't know, like designed in a, that way. So I thought that, I think that like, like how we like see exhibitions, how we like experience ex ex exhibitions should be think. And then like, I think there should be like a systemical change. And then we should like change our behaviors because like in the virtual exhibitions that I enjoy most, was mm -hmm. the ones that actually happening in like space or like different places. And there, there were like also live events that I can attend with my avatar and kind of things. I think they should be like more interactive because otherwise it's just like, like I said, it's like a less of an like physical experience. So you lack that, mm -hmm. uh, like you miss that experience. So I think it shouldn't be like that, but more like a different ideas about like how we, I don't know, see things and how we observe things. And Tim, also you have an online exhibition now, and uh, what's your experiences and uh, how do you design your um, online exhibition uh, uh, I, artwork? I mean, I think in, in this online exhibit, um, which is kind of like hubs based, so it has some of the limits that uh, Ken mentioned, but what is nice about it is uh, that it's actually a combination between kind of like mimicking a real museum. I mean, it's basic, it's done together with the Meet, which is a center for digital art from Myland. But um, so there's the exhibit space and then you have the pieces. And when you look at this piece, you can jump into a sub world which is the actual art piece. And in the moment where you are in that subworld, you are not anymore in the exhibit space, but it is like in our case with loving ones, you're in the tunnel and you're going and seeing the images and videos from them and you can explore them. And I think this is kind of like uh, quite interesting because sometimes people need kind of like some reference to reality, at least when they're coming new into this medium, but mm -hmm. then 
thinking about the walls of the museum as something flexible that can merge and open up and turn into the artwork itself mm -hmm. that's like the second level so when you jump inside suddenly everything is the artwork you know everything that is around yeah. you so yeah and Michael's uh, has a question in an AR exhibition case that works maybe experienced with or without AR is there extra pressure to balance both our AR and non-AR experiences. This is perhaps an issue of accessibility. And he wrote it. <laughs> I mean, I think like it really depends on the work, you know, because yeah. some works, they only work together. In, mm -hmm. in loving ones, you could probably also look at the portraits and their their work as pictures kind of like they're quite moving and you could maybe also look at the videos mm -hmm. but um, it it works best when they're together you know and mm -hmm. accessibility is always a question right mm -hmm. but th this is always in technologically driven art you know you need to somehow have the computer and you need to somehow or have the headset or have the iphone and ipad it's definitely something to consider mm -hmm. but um maybe Besides, like, uh, I mean, obviously, it's always nice when they when they go together and they balance. But I wanted to maybe mention one more point that you asked before, what is like the role of the audience in all of this. And I think because I think it's quite important to, to consider that. And I think mm -hmm. kind of like um, the audience in, in reality, when we conceptualize works, we try to really imagine what the audience feels when they're inside of that yeah. space, you know, and, and that is yeah. kind of like the core, they have to be somehow you have to inspire them or they have to be moved. And yeah. something that Meltem said earlier was quite interesting because she was talking about the filters and how suddenly um, the people become part of the artwork. And I think that is very special about kind of like AR and XR in the wider sense, because people can really become part of the artwork. And if you look like at the 70s, there was a whole notion that like mm -hmm. the audience finishes the artwork in their head, right? Yeah. Like in their subjective vision, they finish the painting, they read the story, they create the characters. And suddenly with AR technology or with XR technologies, they can really do it. You can create art pieces that only come into existence when the audience is there. And when they interact with it, it can dynamically change and it become a, mm -hmm. can become a very uh, kind of personal experience. I think that is quite nice to kind of consider and explore. Maybe it's the main question in the experience. What is the experience and what is the raw material of artworks? Maybe the question is important, I think. And um, last question, and then questions are welcome. And uh, I, I want to refer to one of the most trending present day topic, topics and maybe and the new um, sell of arts, artworks. And NFT, and do you think NFT and uh, XR technologies and um, will be brought together? And uh, Malta. <laughs> yes, I think yeah, for sure. Like for like NFT level, I'm like a little, little hesitant at the beginning. I was like yeah. really concerned about the environmental <laughs> issues and yeah, because yeah. at the beginning I was thinking that is more like a systemical change, and now I'm thinking more like it's just like a digital platform maybe. But it's still I'm like seeing the huge potential, and I'm really curious about it. Also, but the, the little bit as a um, problems thing. And then yeah, NFT. because actually, like my main problem before was that I I could never like sell my gifts in Turkey, and I was thinking that there should be a platform like that. Now NFTs are the actually yeah. like really perfect <laughs> thing, perfect yeah. thing for me. But I'm like yeah. now a little hesitant. But uh, still, I think that because like most of the people are asking me like if I buy it, how I'm gonna exhibit it and stuff like that like with the, these XR technologies so they can actually like, I don't know, like, because also like all the people are having their meetings in a virtual spaces so they can hang their, <laughs> I don't know, like just both products like behind them or just like they can just, I don't know, uh, put the things that they bought in their virtual spaces because like with the people, like with the collectors, it's like this question is like always coming up to me. And then I think that for this angle, I think it's, uh, like it, it adds like lots of potential also. Yeah, and John and Tim. Um, 
Yeah, I, I guess, for instance, with AR, uh, when we were, you know, imagining how augmented reality is going to work, we were imagining more of what's going to be the next step of VR. We were talking about Magic League, we were talking about AR glasses, and, you know, Apple is going to have their new glass that you, everybody is, you know, uh, the, the, the conversation was phones are dying, AR devices are going to be the new, you know, next cool thing uh, or next big thing. And every, everybody's uh, working on that new technologies, but somehow, uh, maybe because of display technologies or battery technologies, we, we couldn't get there. And then, uh, especially with Facebook's or Instagram's filters, uh, I, I think they're responsible for this. They, or, or maybe Apple, they turned phones into AR devices. And then these filters became very popular and, and suddenly people started to think AR is this thing that you do with your camera. Actually, the case wasn't that. The case was how can we place things in three dimensions in the digital space? Yeah. So with NFTs, currently it's very social media driven and our social media contents are looped mm -hmm. videos and images, you know, that because yeah. of that, I think uh, they're benefiting from that social media based content approach in the mm -hmm. NFT platforms. But hopefully the future of, digital uh, artworks it's not going to be limited to looped videos and uh, digital images but and 3d just like still 3d renders but mm -hmm. hopefully mm -hmm. we're going to be uh dealing with more uh more imaginative pieces that really utilize that potential of virtual spaces with new yeah. technologies and platforms yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I think kind of like from my side, I would I would say there's, there's both kind of like some critical thought uh, behind all of that. And then, of course, there's also a lot of potential that, that is great that you could kind of like get into. But um, if you look at the critical side, like, for example, in photography, um, there was an essay from Walter Benjamin that was called Art in the Age of uh, Mechanical Reproduction. And the whole idea of that essay was that because of the invention of photography, the idea of the authenticity of a work of art, of a painting is gone. You now suddenly everyone can have a picture of themselves, but before <laughs> only the elite could have the picture, you know? Yeah. And that was a very kind of like liberating thought. And um, unfortunately, Walter Benjamin completely failed with it because right now photography art photography, you can buy limited editions, you know, so yeah. the nature of the medium that, that mm -hmm. Walter Benjamin saw as a big potential, the fact that you can reproduce it, was uh, kind of driven into the commercial context, and it's made unique now, it's unique because I have a limited edition, and that whole idea, of course, yeah, you want to jump and, in? Uh, um, Mac Lugan says that medium is the message, but I think medium is not a message in for an <laughs> NFT. <laughs> Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, this, this <laughs> is message, yeah. totally. And I mean, reproduction in the aid of digital art is even more crazy, right? Because yeah. there is no limit. You can copy as much as you want. So suddenly we take the NFT <laughs> tokens and that gives you the feeling of authenticity. It's authentic. It's mine. You know, I can buy it. Yeah. I can own it. So it's kind of like it, it, it's not really what the medium is in terms mm -hmm. of like what digital uh, yeah. what digital artwork can do. But nevertheless, it's super important that art, artists can actually, you know, earn money from their work and that there can be yeah. some kind of ownership and copyright and that it can be related to NFTs. So I think it, it, it's also, it can be used and it should be used. And especially when you look at those kind of like aspects we have been talking about earlier, mm -hmm. if you think about yeah maybe like there's a work that happens in real time and I can buy a moment, right? Mm -hmm. That is being done in NFL, in the football league in America. They're selling the best moments of the game, you mm -hmm. know, and yeah. the best moments are the most important, the most expensive. <laughs> time right? and space like that. Exactly. <laughs> time, <laughs> time and space. <laughs> <laughs> it's really and, crazy. Um, Michael's uh, questions is a good question. I think in mediated related, related 
realities, sorry, in mediated realities, the viewer's experience can be subjective by design. They can be shown different things without being aware that what they see is different than uh, what others see. Uh, it's, is this something that interests um, artists like on the panel or it's a shared experience more attractive than technology already is a, a bit uh, distracting for viewers. Yes. Let me think about that. <laughs> uh, it, yeah, it, okay. I, 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 I don't think so because, you know, uh, like I said, my whole intention with that installation was how can I uh, make this installation more about the art and the environment and the aesthetics and the, mm -hmm. you know exp exploration and, and less about the technology so um and and i think you know the vr the v virtual reality part of that experience was maybe 10 percent of it and and the more was about um both experiencing the whole physical aspect of it and also um witnessing Mm -hmm. the, the person who is experiencing the VR was a was an experiment in itself to just just watching that because like a lot of people were just uh, seeing a virtual reality experience for the first time in a gallery setting and and they were witnessing this person who is teleported mm -hmm. into this virtual space so just just that uh, scenery was interesting to look at and you know yeah. That's what I think. Okay. Actually, I want to add something that what Tim said before, like about the authenticity with the MPGs, like because everyone was claiming that like the provenance, like the past of the paintings and the art can be traced with uh, MPG technology and blockchain technology. But actually like one month ago, like one of my gifts were stolen and put it on the like, uh, super rare, not, oh. not super rare, sorry, like rareable platform. And then they sold one of my gifts even there. And then it's like now nobody then like hearing from other artists that actually they are like workers stolen and then put on the platform because it's like it, it seemed like easy to like make money. So it's like it's actually like really controversial issue around it also like it, because like I report also like they use someone else's photo and name but my gift and then the other artists didn't know about it also. So we both reported and then like, they were even saying that like the, the, like the money from the sales were, will go to the NGOs like related to the issues or kind of things. Yeah. But then I asked them like, because someone bought my gifts, like what happened to the gift that like they bought, how they compensate for that and stuff like that. But they will like, they never answered me on Twitter. So. I don't know, these issues are also like on my mind thinking about it. So I just want to add that. Yeah, thank you. I mean, maybe can I just reply to that shortly? Because I think it's a very val valid point actually. And maybe that's also a chance for blockchain technology to actually really be able to relate, um, you know, artwork to the authors independent from the NFTs and if you want to sell it or not. But uh, of course it happens in the internet that uh, since it's driven by people, there's also abuse and stealing and lying and everything else that we have as human beings. So it would be nice to kind of have actually a way of, of, um, of kind of like being able to say what should be done or what should not be done with your work because um, it can be used for all kinds of things, not, not only selling, but also maybe making statements that you wouldn't like to make or something like that. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you for your uh, participating in panel and sharing your ideas. And um, thank you um, also, Michael, and to um, organize it. And uh, thank you for all of you. And thank you very much for moderating this panel. And. Um sharing your time and, and asking a lot of insightful questions and, and eliciting a lot of insightful responses from the artists today. So uh, again, I would like to thank Meltem and Tim and John very much for your time and, uh, and sharing your work and, and opening up some of the, the things that inspire and, and it, as well as you know, maybe concern you as well as uh, the, the, state of, the state of the art world and, uh, and the rest of the world. So thank you very much everyone who attended today.
live. And then thank you everyone who's going to be watching this later. Uh, it was a, a pleasure to have you here.